Can Germany succeed where others have failed and broker a political solution to the long-running conflict in Libya? Chancellor Merkel says last Sunday's conference here in Berlin was a first step. The Chancellor did in fact succeed in getting the main players in this proxy war to sit down at one table, including the Russian and Turkish presidents until now on opposing sides. They and other foreign backers have been channeling weapons and money to rebel General Khalifa Haftar on the one hand, or the UN-backed government of Prime Minister al-Sarraj on the other. Now all are pledging to uphold a UN embargo, but the two rivals declined even to meet in Berlin, and the UN embargo has proven anything but durable in the past. Power struggle in Libya, does peace have a chance? And here to answer that question are our guests. Mirko Kalbert is an independent journalist who regularly reports from Northern Africa, has been based in both Libya and Tunis. And he says to start a political dialogue, we need less focus on Haftar and al-Sarraj and more on the trauma caused by 42 years of Gaddafi. Otherwise, Libya is in danger of splitting. And it's a pleasure to welcome Alan Posner back to the show. He's a political commentator for the daily newspaper Die Welt. And he says a weapons embargo when a legitimate government is being attacked by rebel powers is wrong. Europe has betrayed the Libyan government and its people. And it's a pleasure to welcome my colleague Mona Hefni, who works in DW's Arabic service. She says agreeing to uphold an arms embargo will make no difference on the ground given the number of actors and interests. So if I listen to those opening statements, they all sound pretty skeptical about whether this agreement can really change anything. But Chancellor Merkel herself actually did quite a bit of expectation management following the conference last Sunday. Wasn't it nonetheless an achievement to even get all the parties around one table talking? I think the achievement was that Libya is now in the focus again. North Africa is now well, uh, again, on, on Europe's agenda. And I think uh, Libya was for too long a crisis that we thought is something like a local sea level crisis that nobody should care about. Just migration was an issue that, uh, that well, through the delivery of, of boats and some help um, was, was cared about. But now we see that this could, be, could have ended up in a regional conflict with Turkish and Egyptian troops, even at the front lines uh, in the south of Tripoli. So I think the achievement is to have a look again on this crisis. But now, certainly, there is a huge burden on the German government because now one has to deliver. Mona, what would you say? Was this, in fact, a small step, getting all these different parties whom you mentioned in the opening statement, getting them at one table? I think uh, getting them on one table is one issue and really implementing uh, the, the decisions that they have been, have been making. Uh, I think uh, this is, this is a, the, the huge uh, um, difference. And I think, uh, theoretically speaking, there have been some decisions that were made. But uh, in the end, if we're really, really looking at reality, um, these uh, decisions can't really be implemented because these countries are playing with double standards. You can't be a war maker and the peacekeeper at the same time. It, it can't happen like that. So we'll come back to that reality. Uh, in a bit more detail in a moment. But, Alan, how do you see it? Well, I see it basically like Mona does. I mean, um, you get people around the table. Not even the European Union can agree. You have France and Italy on different sides. Germany pretending to be neutral as if we weren't desperately interested in what's going on there. And if you don't even have the European Union together, how on earth are you going to get these other people? Uh, they just go blah, 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 pose for the cameras... And then they go home and they do, they do their thing, as we've seen. The first thing Haftar did when he got back was attack the airport in, uh, in Tripolis. Uh, the first thing he did. He you know, got back, got on the phone, said, send over some rockets. Forget it. <laughs> Let us hear some voices from Libya and whether they think the, Libya conference, the Berlin conference could, in fact, make a difference. If the Berlin Conference takes the interests of the Libyan people and Libya into consideration, we welcome it. But if it reflects the interests of other parties, we won't be happy with it. The truth is, the Berlin Conference is a trap for Libya. A real trap. 
And I don't think anything good will come of it. I can't tell if we're pessimistic or optimistic. There are so many conferences, in Russia for instance, but that one yielded no results. So some pretty guarded answers there, speaking of expectation management. Mirko, what are you hearing from people in Libya? You report regularly from there. What are they saying? Libya is in the same conflict as it was in 2011, when people went on the streets in the east and outside Tripoli, not only against Gaddafi, but also for the, let's say, just uh, distribution of wealth, of money. It's Africa's richest country. And nothing much changed since then. Um, and Europe looked away for a long time that at the end you have now, let's say, one group in Tripoli controlling uh, the NOC, the National Oil Corporation, the central bank, and deciding about the uh, distribution of wealth. That goes as well to the east, but let's not forget most of the oil facilities are in the east. And that's what we see now, that you have uh, a closing of the oil uh, ports in the east because um, people really demand after the Berlin conference that now talk about distributing um, the money on the central bank from the central bank in a way to whole Libya. And I think people expected a lot from the Berlin conference, but now they see this is uh, maybe a just maybe just a starting point or maybe nothing. So uh, now immediately a follow up has to happen, and that's what we have to see now. Mona, it was pretty clear from those sound bites that. All the people we heard feel their country has become a pawn in an ongoing power game. You talked in your opening statement about all the different actors involved here. This is a really big challenge, but can you give us the short summary version of who they are and what are the different interests involved? Yes, of course. Uh, you have um, three main interests. One is oil, the other is ideological, and the third one is the migration crisis. Um, countries are uh, fighting each other uh, because of that. You have the Emirates and Egypt uh, um, and um, uh, Russia supporting uh, uh, um, Haftar. And you have on the other side um, Italy and... Um, um, what, what was it again? Um, uh, sorry, sorry, Turkey. Turkey, of course, uh, backing, uh, backing uh, Asaraj in uh, Tripoli. And the, uh, Asaraj uh, being the UN recognized, recognized government. Recognized, yes. And uh, uh, due to all these conflicting, sorry. yes, and, and Qatar, of course, you have also uh, Jordan uh, that is uh, um, playing in the background, Saudi Arabia. Um, so you have so many actors including the militias that are supported by these different actors. So this makes the whole situation quite confusing and uh, it's very easy to throw the responsibility on the other side once any attack happens. So tell me this, the Arab countries who are involved, you mentioned Egypt, uh, Emirates, uh, Emirates playing a very big role. Um, how did they see the Berlin conference? I think they participated in it, but um, let's be uh, honest about it. I mean, uh, in the end, uh, Sisi, if, in, the, the Egyptian president, Sisi, even if he participated, he does uh, support Haftar and he does send uh, weapons over. So I think um, making promises in the end um, is very easy, but whether he will implement it or not is another question. So, Alan, uh, another uh, challenge along the same lines. Also at the table here in Berlin were France, Italy, China, U.S., um, what was their role? Destructive. <laughs> no. Um, look, it's like, again, and I'm going to say it, um, so many different players, so many different interests. Um, none of them are interested in the Libyan people. Let's say that. None of them. None of them any interest whatsoever in what Mirko said, that this oil belongs to the Libyan people, that they should, it should be distributed and used and invested and so on. None of them. Right, and um, and they're not. The Berlin conference doesn't change that one little bit. What you have to do is institute. Uh, we'll get to that later, right? Institute a firm government that's in the, capable of acting in the interests of the, of the Libyan people, but it's not happening. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned firm government. Let's go right there, <laughs> right now, and take a closer look at the power struggle. Libya, as you pointed out, spiraled into violence following the fall of the dictator Muammar Gaddafi. Successive administrations have failed to gain power over the country's many militias. 
Al-Siraj took the helm of the government in 2016, but he controls only a small area around the capital, Tripoli. Large swathes of territory are under the forces commanded by Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar. Farther to the south, local militias make money from smuggling refugees. So let me first of all begin by asking about the legitimacy of this UN-recognized government, uh, Mirko. In fact, it was never elected. He essentially, al-Siraj, came into power as a result of a United Nations initiative. Yes, he came in power late 2015 because the international community needed desperately a government. <clears throat> Besides, and every country needs a government, but the Islamic State in those days controlled over 180 kilometers of the Libyan coast. So this war against um, the Islamic State was fought by fighters from Misrata with, well, the invitation of the Saraj government. This is why it was installed, I would say, by UN and also supported by European Union in uh, late 2015, but the, the parliament that is now uh, in the East uh, never, never inaugurated this uh, government. And this, this is the argument for many people in the East that uh, they as well have a non-recognized government themselves in Beda. Then you have this government, which uh, the mandate is, as the mandate of the parliament, the Libyan parliament, it's run out because two years have been passed. So I think it is a chance to bring these institutions, two governments, two parliaments, two armies, now together, uh, despite the legitimacy, as you, as you said. I agree with your point that you said we, the West, um, really didn't support the internationally recognized government, but this recognition is something that was just a need in 2016. So, Alan, let me ask you this, because you did say in your opening statement uh, that a weapons embargo is wrong when a legitimate government is being attacked by rebel powers. So I looked up legitimacy under international law to just remind myself. And in fact, the legitimacy of a government very much depends on its effective control of its territory. Now, Al Siraj as we said, never elected and actually in control of only a very small amount of Libyan territory. So is this government really legitimate in that sense? Well, if you just look at the territory, most of the territory that is outside the coastal strip is basically uninhabited. So that gives, you know, just saying how much territory he has uh, doesn't say a thing. Um, the second thing is, what if, if this is true, what you're saying, this means that if any rebel organization backed from outside, as Haftar is by the Russians, um, can control enough territory, then they automatically become legitimate. And that surely is not what is meant by, by, by a legitimacy. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we had the same thing in the Spanish Civil War. Um, did General Franco, um, who, who, who came to power under a general arms embargo by the Western powers, did he gain the legitimacy when he finally surrounded um, uh, uh, Madrid and, and, and forced the revolutionaries out? Of course not. He was never legitimate. Never. And, uh, and the same thing is here. We, um, general Haftar is a pawn, basically of Russian interests, unfortunately helped by France, thus rendering the e European Union impotent. Mona, Haftar says he is the only one who is capable of essentially saving Libya from becoming a haven for Islamic terrorists. And the fact is that he and his forces did force the Islamic State out of the eastern part of the country, out of Benghazi, at great cost in human life to their own forces. So is there something to be said for that? And does that give him legitimacy? I think, um, the, the, like you've looked up, uh, the, the term legitimacy, I mean, what is really legitimate uh, does differ within the, the whole context. Because in the end, if some countries are uh, supporting Haftar, it means that he's, to them, kind of legitimate. Um, so uh, what I think is that you have in, in Tripoli, you have, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood, and you have uh, different militias. But uh, we, don't, we don't want to forget that even with Haftar, there are some Salafists fighting. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm not quite sure if, if the main 
issue for Haftar is uh, is being against the IS or 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 um, um, uh, like uh, fighting them. I think the main issue is for Haftar being in power, and I think another main issue is that Haftar doesn't want Turkey to intervene into this uh, this ho this whole conflict and to take power, especially after the uh, maritime uh, agreement that was made with uh, with Tripoli. Maritime agreement for uh, for drilling Turkey rights, to do yes. drilling rights for yes. oil. Uh, yes. Uh, in, exactly. in uh, Libyan waters. I would so, like to yeah. add, so, add something to that. Uh, the, this battle between the concept of a militia, of Islamist militias, and let's say something that is the former army, which now represented by Haftar, it started already at, during the revolution. And it was one of the competitors uh, of Haftar who was killed by, uh, in summer 2011, um, by, by radical groups. And this battle is going on since then. And since then, you have Egypt on the one side and you have Qatar on the other hand. So I think uh, it's not anymore a question of legitimacy. I think this is now really to hammer out a deal of uh, power sharing. And if the Berlin Conference was really helpful, we, we don't know exactly now. But it really, there is a need to go beyond legitimacy and to go beyond... Um, who's right and wrong. This is about avoiding a m bigger regional war, I think, between an Islamist militia idea and a dictatorship police state idea. Let's come back to where we need to go from here in just a moment, but I want to pick up on one of the interests that you talked about that we haven't delved into yet, and that is the question of refugees. When the German foreign minister was trying to explain why it is that Germany decided to mediate this conference in Berlin uh, with uh, the hope of bringing some kind of political solution forward, he said, quite bluntly, we want to prevent Libya becoming a second Syria. Syria has taught Europe that instability in the Middle East makes itself felt on the other side of the Mediterranean. A refugee camp near Tripoli after an airstrike last July. At least 40 people were killed. Many others were injured, often seriously. In spite of the massive risks they face, migrants are still heading for Libya, either as a destination or a stop on their way to Europe. International organizations estimate that anywhere from 700,000 to 1 million migrants are currently inside the war-torn country. Officially, only some 43,000 are registered as refugees. They face random arrests, abductions, forced labor, and even torture. Even in the state-run reception camps, human rights activists and diplomats have found catastrophic living conditions. Many of these migrants see the perilous crossing to Europe as preferable to the living hell of the Libyan civil war. But are the refugees the sole motivation for the German and European Union involvement in Libya? Ellen, Europe has been studiously looking the other way for a long time in regard to Libya or outright meddling, as you pointed out. But on this point of refugees, don't France, Italy and Germany actually have a common interest? And could that help propel some kind of progress on finding a political solution? Well, they should, shouldn't they? I mean, um, uh, it, you know, the... the, the, the Parts of the Libyan coast are obviously controlled by people smugglers and so on. We've, we've seen this. There's no effective, there's no way we could implement, for instance, having camps there to process people and then take them in an orderly fashion to Europe because the camps are the, the living hell that your report ta talked about. The fact is that oil trumps human life here because the French, Total, they're... Uh, they are interested in the oil fields controlled by Mr. Haftar and the Italian a and &E are interested in the oil fields controlled by the government. And they don't, you know, and, and, and as for migrants, well, uh, they would rather uh, you use populist rhetoric at home against, uh, uh, against uh, migrants than doing something about that and sacrificing some of their exclusive oil interests. It's, I mean, it's beyond, honestly, it's beyond belief that civilized European countries should behave like this. Mona, uh, I quoted the German foreign minister's appeal to keep Libya from becoming a second Syria. What does Syria teach us in terms of where we go from here? What needs to happen now to give a political process toward some form of peacemaking a chance? I think it should show us that, um, like, um, 
conferences do not really, um, I mean, talking about the issue and, and making agreements uh, is, is like a parallel thing to what's happening in reality. We've, we've had so many conferences about Syria and we've had so many conferences about Libya till now. And we've seen that uh, in the end, and we've heard it through the, the opinions of people in Libya, that there's some kind of frustration about that because um, even if uh, they sounded quite pessimistic after uh, the, the conference, uh, quite optimistic after the conference, I think uh, in the end we should learn that talking is one thing and what's really happening there is a completely different thing. So, Mirko, one of the criticisms of the Berlin conference was that, yes, everybody said they're going to abide by the UN weapons embargo, but there was no agreement, for example, on sanctions against countries that don't do so. And as Alan mentioned, uh, Haftar got back to Libya and promptly uh, started hostilities uh, up again. So how could we, how could the powers involved actually be driven to keep their word and the EU foreign ministers talk now of essentially rebooting the so-called SOFIA naval mission, which was originally a mission to interdict human smugglers and prevent smuggling in the Mediterranean. Now, apparently, there's an idea it will be uh, repurposed and become a mission to interdict weapons instead. Is that a good alternative? Could that actually take us a step further? It should have happened long time ago. Um, uh, it was made since many years, ships are coming from Turkey and from other countries to the Libyan coast, and not only weapons, drugs, all kind of illegal uh, smuggling. And um, I always wondered why the Sophia missions before and the NATO missions before did not uh, look for, for the smugglers. And I think uh, we have an arms embargo since, since 2011. Mm -hmm. um, Germany is heading the sanctions committee of the United uh, of the Security Council. So, okay, it's now late, uh, but not too late, maybe. And I think, yes, the SOFIA mission has to stop any ship that is going east or west. Um, there could be also control of the, of the airports. We saw planes coming from the Emirates landing in Benghazi yesterday and to Misrata from Turkey the day before. So you see one, two days after the conference, certainly deliveries of whatever kind are continuing. And um, yeah, Germany has certainly no, no thing to pressure. Just one thing, and this is to hold everybody responsible. That we have an ICC in The Hague, we could do a, um, an extra... International Criminal Court? International, yes, the Criminal Court. We could uh, talk about Libyan uh, players being held responsible. We have a panel of experts on Libya that is uh, publishing reports twice a year, twice. You hear all all violations in detail. So one has to take this by the hand and publish it and go against each player. I think German diplomats have not more, but it's something. So Mirko has just outlined a number of measures that sound um, at least theoretically feasible. Alan, on the other hand, as you have pointed out, we have powerful interests. Let's take just one of those measures, this Sophia naval mission. Various European countries, including Germany, bailed out of it, essentially, saying that in its form that it was supposed to interdict human smuggling, it was too difficult because uh, the Europeans couldn't agree on what to do with those refugees who were then actually uh, stopped in mid-ocean. So could it work as a, as a military mission, essentially, to interdict weapons, or are we likely to see disjunction once again between, between the Europeans? It could work, but it won't. We have a mission in front of the Lebanese coast we, uh, to stop weapons getting to Hezbollah, and as a result of that, and it's German, which is the leading nation on that, as a result of that, Hezbollah has got more rockets than any European nation, right? That's that's the way we do business in, in the Mediterranean, and it's a disgrace. So um, we could, I mean, we're rich countries, we have navies. Of course we could stop weapons getting there by sea, but I don't think there's any political and especially military will to do so. Mona, back to the title. Does peace have a chance, and if so, how? I think it's uh, quite difficult to achieve peace at the moment. Um, if we look at the, the whole situation, the whole chaos that is happening there, um, I must 
uh, one other point I wanted to say is uh, if you have uh, like a controlling mission over there, um, it should be provided that the uh, pr participating countries aren't the ones that are really um, uh, being the ones that are fighting there because it wouldn't make any sense. Um, so I think um, achieving peace is very difficult and I think that uh, at the moment, I must say, I sound a bit pessimistic, but I think it's a very, very long and, and very complicated process. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us uh, today. And thanks to all of you uh, there for tuning in. Ah, I see we have one more minute on the clock. Then I'm just going to get the other two to weigh in on whether you think peace does have a chance, if not short term, long term. Libya is a very young country. It was only 70 years long, an independent country before Gaddafi came to power. So this is state building, I think, and it's not uh, ending a conflict. And so. I think as an, a European Union envoy and a new attitude, more firm, is needed for the next 20 years, not for the next two months. Thank you. Once again, thanks to all of you for being with us. And thanks to you out there for tuning in. See you soon. <laughs>